What's up guys, my name is Lex Veltes and welcome back to another episode of Lex Reflex. Today we're going to be jumping straight to 2009, it's more high stakes poker, 400, 800, 1600, we have to straddle on now and we're going to be playing against this legend, Daniel Negrano, in what is one of the bigger pots that I've played in my career. It starts off with Daniel Negrano in the cutoff, he Daniel makes it 6000 to go, bit, 6, and I decide to 3-bet with the ace-8. So, Ace-8 is a very good hand when you're in the button versus the cutoff. Um, you're going to have a high card advantage plenty of times because Negrano is going to open all kinds of King-8, King-7, King-5 suited, all of the queen highs, bunch of jack highs, as you can see. Also, of course, the fact that you have an ace blocks Negrano's strongest raising combos like aces, ace, king, ace, queen, um, as well as the fact that people behind you are less likely to forebet because there isn't going to be as much ace, queen, and ace, king. It's also a very easy hand to fold to if somebody forebets, um, and of course I can take the pot down preflop. I wouldn't recommend going lower than ace-8, but I think this is a good spot to take. I will say a small point of critique is the fact that I play so aggressive, I'm not going to get the respect that I need to be able to 3-bet with a hand like ace-8 offsuit. But on the flip side, Negrano opens more hands than he probably should from the cutoff, so I feel like those two things negate each other. And again, Lex, 20,000 with an ace-8 offsuit. <laughs> All right, falls back to Negrano. He makes the call, which is absolutely perfect. You don't want to 4-bet jack high hands. I think Daniel's seen enough of what Lex done in the last few hands. You're not going to fold this in tournaments or in cash yeah, games really right. ever. And this is still fine, so we go to a flop. Yeah, I don't I really like the purple the cash yet. Well, Talking a lot to Negranu. I might not. It's pretty impossible. I'll tell you what anyway. I'm going to do. I'm going to check in the dark because there's no flop I'm betting anyway. All right. Thanks, Helmut. <laughs> thanks, Helmut. That is amazing. Gin for Daniel. All right. So the flop comes. And we see 10, 7, 8. Of course, Negrano checked dark, so he doesn't get a decision. He's actually right. There's very little that you're going to lead anyway from the cutoff to the button. So it doesn't really matter. Of course, I think checking in the dark is a little bit silly because you just take away a decision. Uh, what if there is a flop you do want to lead? Um, so we see 10, 8, 7. Now, this is a very interesting board. We definitely can bet this board some, but if we're going to bet, we're always going to prefer small bets on this board in position. Back then, there wasn't really any small betting. We only had medium-sized and large-sized bets, and that would be terrible in my position on this board. So I actually love the fact um, that I check back uh, relatively quickly. Another advantage of checking here, I think, is the fact that I can now use my aggressive image the other way around. People are always going to expect me to both bet my bluffs, but also they're going to expect me to get max value with my good hands. So to have a hand with a little bit of deception on a board like this is really good because Negrano is going to assume that I'm going to have a hand like ace-king, ace-queen, king-queen, maybe even an underpair or some shitty seven uh, that doesn't really want to bet. So I think that I can definitely reap some benefits uh, from playing my hand like this as well. Daniel flopped the nut straight. Lex has enough to keep him dancing. Turn is perfect. Bet 20. I want you to take it out. That's 20,000. Really? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. All right, so now Negrano bets 20,000. Uh, my joke, unfortunately, didn't really land. Negrano told me a story once about a guy that played a lot of cash games, and anytime somebody bet a brick of cash, they wanted you to count it out and uh, show it, but he thought that I was being serious. Of course we're not. Anyway, Negrano bets half pot. I mean, this is really great for our hand. The three doesn't change anything. Uh, the only hand that it introduces that we lose to is pocket threes. Sure, there's still plenty uh, that we beat, and I think that um, uh, we still have a great bluff catcher. Again, the ground is not going to expect me to have really a lot of strong pairs. He's probably not going to expect me to have a 10 even. So this is a very safe bet, I think, for him. I think that versus somebody with my style, um, he can pretty much bet everything here. He can bet anything for value, and he can, he can start almost pure bluffing. Like, that's how, that's how weak I think he perceives my range here. All that said, I think that I have an easy call. I don't even think there's anything to consider. Raising would be pretty awful because now all of a sudden I'm over-representing my hand and I don't really want to open the door to any uh, three-bet shoves. I really just want to take this hand to showdown and just call this bet. Uh, do I want purple change? Yes or no? I do really like the way I come off in this hand. Lex calls. Like I'm very critical in some other episodes of uh, Lex Reflex. Um, with the way I'm talking during pots or something, but I really do think that I come off like I don't really care about the spot. Really bad card for Lex. Only worst card would be an ace or an eight. True that, Gabe. That's an awful card. Bet 50. All right, so in my opinion, that's one of the best cards that I can hit. It's perfect for me. I'm already losing to a 10, right? So the fact that there's another 10 on board now just means the, uh, that that chance is getting a little bit smaller. So in that sense, it's a great card. 
also, if my opponent, Negrano, in this case, has an 8, he's more likely to value bet it now because it's also less likely that I have a 10. So if Negrano is going to have a hand like uh, Jack-8, King-8, Queen-8, he's going to be a little bit more comfortable uh, value betting this because he hopes that I have some underpair or that I'll make a hero call with ace high. You have to get value from really marginal spots in these games, and these things are really worth considering. Another small advantage is the fact that I counterf counterfeit 8-7 now, which is a likely hand that he could call with preflop. Plus, if he has those two cards, he can definitely value bet because he even blocks a lot of my traps if I would have had 8s or 7s. This now becomes such an easy call for me. I've underrepresented my hand. I even beat some value bets. My hand strength doesn't correlate to the way my image is perceived at all. And to really drive home uh, how easy this call actually is, if you plug this into a modern day solver, solver actually loves to raise my hand on the river for value. That's how strong it is and that's how few hands I actually lose to. So all that said, I go for a snap call. A call. Go straight? No. I, I got a straight. Oh, okay. Well, I don't. Well, on a scale with Seven. calling quads two pair being the worst kind of slow roll, oh. leaving out the dependent clause I have before you say the word straight Wait, let me give it. Oh, that's fine. is also a slow roll. I don't think Daniel meant it, but it was. It's definitely some truth to what Gabe is saying. And of course, like I want to be very clear that Negrano had no bad intentions when he says it. So I'm a little bit annoyed at the end of that hand, but I think it's mostly because of the fact that I lost the 8-6 uh, versus Andrew Robel, and he was tanking with his set. Then I got smashed by Ivy, and now this hand happened pretty early in the session. And this hand is a pretty big cooler uh, if you look at the dynamics and our hand strength on this board. Um, obviously, uh, Negrano had no bad intentions when he said it like that. I think that Negrano was just surprised at how quickly I called um, because he might have thought that I was slow playing a straight and then the board pairs and I know I don't want to raise or something and I call. But um, obviously, the moment that he says, do you have a straight, I know that I'm not going to be good, which was a little bit annoying. And it's also a bit unnecessary to ask that. But again, the ground and I are good friends, so you know, there's no, uh, no bad intentions there. I just kind of want to explain uh, why, my, why my reaction came off that way. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really uh, like this look back. Um, next time we're going to go over the hand versus Doyle Brunson. Don't miss that. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of my new videos. Uh, if you like the video, make sure you drop a like. If you have anything to say about the hand or the strategy or any questions, make sure you drop a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. I learned it from you. I kept the pot small on the flow. Yeah, I don't know. We would have got it in, obviously. Lex took it very well.